Keep going. That was it. Okay. Thank you, you very in? much. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Um, it's the same as Brother Freddie had said. Uh, the verse that supports that is 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so it's just as was said in the reading above, uh, as Job confessed his sin to God, he opened himself up to the mercy and grace of God to forgive and restore him. So when we in like manner confess our sins, this opens us up to God's mercy and grace to forgive and to restore us. Man. You're right on target, both of you. Yeah, we, um, uh, I think Job's friends and maybe some of our friends too are missed this whole point that, uh, you know, we have to, uh, we have shortcomings and, uh, we don't really control anything. It's all through the sovereignty of God's grace. And so, with that understanding, even if we read back with Moses is earlier that I read earlier about we have to what? Uh, I think it was five. You have to obey and keep the covenant of God, you know, with admitting your shortcomings opens the door for you to humble yourself and be faithful to God's opportunity commitment and you always know and then that leads us to a better understanding because we know then that we're not really really in control you know and this again I want to bring it back to this whole lesson of Job and everything that we're studying is all about us trying to be obedient and giving us examples of how to be true comforters to those who are in need or though and that being said in need of hearing the gospel and in need of uh, support in brief in need of support even in joyful times you know and we have to our words you know can be like honeycombs but then also sweet to the ear, but they can also be razor sharp as that double-edged sword. And and just sometimes just being quiet like Job's friends did in the beginning is all that one needs is to know that that support is there, knowing that, hey, they you were there for me. Even though, we're going to see later on, even though these were miserable comforters, as Job called them, uh, We'll see in the end, did he do like I might have done? <laughs> y'all talked about me like a dog. See, see, y'all, uh -huh, all this stuff. But I knew I was on the right track, but they kept telling you to repent. But you were going to see at the end if Job's going to be like Brother Joe would be over there being mad at them and holding a grudge for punishing him. So anyone else on this question? I know it's early, <laughs> er, but we're almost to our regular time in five minutes or so, so we, we should be knocking some of the dust out by now. So we're going to go on if no one else wants to say anything about this section and go on, and we're going to have our reader do repent, 42, 7 through 9. All right. After the Lord had finished speaking to Job, he said to Eliphaz, the Timonite, 
I am angry with you and your two friends. Excuse me, I, I got ahead of myself. Okay, take your time. I'm going to start again now. I'm at the okay. right place. After the Lord had finished speaking to Job, he said to Eliphaz, the Timonite, I'm angry with you and your two friends, for you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. Now take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer a burnt offering for yourselves. Then my servant Job will pray for you. I will surely accept his prayer and not deal with you as your follies deserve. For you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. Then Eliphaz the Timonite, Bildad the Shumite, and Zephar the Nemathanite went and did as the Lord had told them. And the Lord accepted Job's prayer. Lord, add a blessing to the reading, the hearing, and the doing of his word. Now, we look at this, and this section is called Repent. And uh, these verses 7 through 9, and uh, it has a lot of stuff in these three verses here that we're going to cover. One, what what are the main thing is that... Uh, uh, that uh, I'm going to start with uh, the Timonite, which if you look on your book on page, uh, I think it's six or seven, it says that a Timonite, a person from Tima, uh, town located in Edom between the southern border of Israel and the Gulf of Aquaba. Term, Temanites were renowned for their wisdom. They talk about that in Jeremiah 49. Job's friend was a Temanite. And so they talked to him. God is talking to him because he was the elders, and they respected the elders. As you can see, everything they did was in the proper protocol of respect for elders, because the eldest spoke, then the next oldest spoke, then the next one, and then finally the youngest fellow spoke. And so God spoke to the head, which was the Temanite. He was the leader and supposed to be the wisest and the knowing the most about God. And But what I like about this whole thing is the repentance portion of it. So as he talked to him, God was angry with him, right? And uh, so he uh, put him in a position to uh, be able to repent from his wrongdoing and his wrong judgment of Job. See, and God always in the process of restoration. Even though these people were wrongly judging Job, he still... Had, he could have brought down fire and had them away with, but he still had compassion and wanting them to see. He, God want, gives us choices, you know, and he wants, uh, he gives us the information, you know. And we all can have salvation, you know, it's available for us, but we have to choose to walk the walk that God plans for us and not the one we choose for ourselves, right? So, in this repentance portion, uh, God was angry because he had not talked the truth. And, you know, so he wanted him to go ahead and gave him, and God gave him a plan for repentance. And this whole thing is, I say, showing a picture of Job as a symbol of Jesus Christ in the point that he was going to be their priest. Their male cares that that more, no, he couldn't have been that because he wasn't with, but he was their priest, and he was their sample of priestliness, you know, and, you know, only the priest could send direct access to God at that point before Jesus Christ, which we have now, but before that, the priest burnt the incense and conducted the sacrifice for the sins of the people, and then 
this really gives us an example of some of the things that uh, we are supposed to be taking care of in our lives right now. If you look at uh, James 5, 16, we're to pray for friends. That's the, our priestly duties that you and I have, just like he had given this to Job for his friends, for the sacrifice of the lamb, rams for seven days and all that. He's given us this same charge if we look and turn our Bibles to uh, James 5, 16. If any, I'm going to flip there, but it's 5, 16, and it says that... Um, Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. That affected, fervent prayer of the righteous man avail is much. And so we go on even a little farther if we go to Second Peter 3, 9, where we are also not only to pray for one another, but we to intercessory prayer in Second Peter. It's saying... Let me let me turn to it. My notes are there, but nothing like reading it right out of the board book. Uh, it's Second Peter three nine, and it says that the Lord is not slack concerning His promises, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering for to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so this section of repentance is showing that God was angry because of their comments on Job, but he couldn't accept their stuff because of their lack of commitment and lack of uh, understanding and knowing him. You know, you have to really, you know, Job knew God and experienced God and was faithful and was committed to the thing. That's why he was presented in the first place, you know. And so, and then, but the most important part of this thing is, uh, everything's important, but another important fact is that in verse number nine, they obeyed, right? And then, you know, even though they had blasted Job all that time, I was wondering when God was talking to Job, I wonder if they could hear him as well. I could hear God as well as Job was hearing him when he was asking him about where was he at. But anyway, they were humbled and then they obedient. See, you can, you want, a lot of people want the prize, you know, oh, bless me, God. Oh, do this, God. Before, like I said, the blessing, like uh, the example I was looking at, before you have put in the work. It, the Bible says, blessed is the man that does these things and not bless me because I want these things. Blessed is the man that does not or does seek God. And so their obedience and accepted God's priest Job to pray for them. And then I look on page 70 in our book. I wanted to read this paragraph right here. It's the next it's the last paragraph right before our question on page 70. It says, God chose what sacrifice we, he would accept, and he also determined who the acceptable mediator for them would be. If they were to uh, be reconciled to God, it has to be done God's way. God allowed the men no say in how it would be accomplished. In so doing, God extended mercy to them by not dealing with them as their senseless declaration about him deserved. And so, and you look right underneath that, the key doctrine, Jesus ascended into heaven and is now exalted at the right hand of God where he is the one mediator 
fully God, fully man, and in whose person is affected the reconciliation between God and man. So Job, again, I pointed out there was a picture of the Christ, but now we have Christ as our mediator between us and God, where Job was the mediator for his four friends here, for their wrongdoing. And also when that paragraph is said, God writes it out. You can't go around doing things your way and expecting to say, yeah, you know, I gave you, you know, I gave you an example. I drive the church bus. I did all this other stuff, God. So that's what I offered up to you. So I want to go to heaven. You know, you can't just do that. Or you can just come. I came to church today and I sat down and I heard a good sermon and I enjoyed the dancing and the singing and the clapping of the hands. So I'm in. You know, it doesn't work like that. You know, God has a plan and you have to, as one of our earlier lessons say, you have to know the plan and you have to stick with the plan and you have to work the plan in order to receive the crown that James talks about, that those who are tested receive get purified when they go through the fire. So here we are on page 70, and then it brings us down to the question right here. And, and it is, what is such a serious matter when uh, pre apparently pious people misrepresent God? And um, how should believers think about this in light of their calling to be ambassadors for God? And I look back to that paragraph. You know, we misrepresent, uh, redirect God's path for our own self, but we are called ambassadors if we follow God's plan and his mediator and God's way and God accepts if we follow the plan he accepts our efforts if we follow his plan and I'm sure someone else can clear this up for us I'm kind of like wobbly in my doing today please bear with me but uh, someone else Read that and uh, answer that for us today. Okay, I'll just say, why is it, rereading the uh, question a little bit, why is it such a serious matter when apparently pious people misrepresent God? I say it's serious because you can lead a person in the wrong direction, you could manipulate the person for whatever purposes, but as an ambassador or representative of Christ, we must present him for who he truly is, which is God's son, our redeemer. Very good. Anyone else? Once again, I agree with uh, Brother Freddie. He cited what, uh, like the manipulation and all of that, this is sinful behavior. And as we know, sin separates us from God. He can't look on that. Uh, and so this misrepresentation of God is sinful. And, it, and when we sin, it then requires us to have a mediator to be reconciled back to Christ. And so as his ambassador, we need to ensure that our faithfulness to God is like Job, that no matter what we are enduring, that the bottom line is remain true to your faith and just trust God. Amen. And to add on to that, trust God and we have to obey and we have to uh, 
uh, do. See, I don't know if you call doing works or anything, but we have to not just sit there when we're called to do something, not doing anything is the same thing as sinning. You know, remember we read back uh, a week or so ago uh, how one of the writers, I forget which one it was, but oh, Charles Sturgeon said that uh, sitting around idle is the worst sin of them all because every idle, and, and you know, we had those proverbs. I'm sure all of our parents have told us uh, an idle mind, uh, idle hands is what? A workshop. You yeah, know? It's workshop. Right. Yeah. And so we have to make sure that, hey, hearing these things and reading these things and studying these things is a difference. Like I always look at my um, brothers and sisters that are in the sound of my voice, and, uh, and I want to just always glorify God for keeping them, all of you, in faith in God throughout your whole lives and the time that you've been doing it, that regardless of the messenger, you still can find the time to receive the message, to grow in the message, you know, and to do what the message says. And I always like, whether you're in the Midwest, whether you're in California, or where you're in Africa, I love hearing what you're doing, like the brother in Kenya, who Willis, who sends me uh, pictures almost on a weekly basis. Uh, you know, he started off rough and voice and speaking in a foreign language and everything, but he's been faithful, and he's also been faithful to share his ministries with me week by week of how he takes in orphans into his home on top of his own family over the two years that I've known him, not only one, but more orphans, and how he has to, not only in Africa, it's not like America when you go to school, uh, you got food, clothes, uniforms, a lot of times it's provided for you, but not there. When you take on a, a orphan or something, then you have to provide for their school books, their school uniforms, their Bibles, their food, and everything. And he shows that. And then he shows again where he goes out and sends me pictures weekly of how he's going out and to the last week alone. He was in the prison with his Bible, talking to prisoners in jail. And also, weeks before that, he sent pictures of how he goes out and he takes by soap bars of soap and shares it with people in the church, elderly, children, and he's shows pictures of him teaching Sunday school lessons in their land. So these are the kind of works that uh, God glorifies, that God enables. This is the stuff that you glorify in doing things for those who are less fortunate. And this is the kind of stuff that God really wants each and not only Willis, but each and every one of us to be doing for people out there, whether it's the little things like making a little bag and taking it out and looking for the homeless and sharing with them, you know, scripture, giving them words. But all this stuff is all part of our repentance, God's program for us in his repentance. But the question is still open. Anyone else want to talk on that one? Which they, uh, Brother Freddie read for us so nicely. No, I'm going to have to ask Pastor to maybe let put us back to nine o'clock. <laughs> we kind of sluggish here at this eight thirty time. <laughs> yeah, maybe we push the service back to eleven and let us have our regular time. I think Sunday school Bible study is the meat and the bones and the bread of religion anyway. That's Joe's opinion. <laughs> no one else on the question will go on to restored. That's going to be in 
Job 42, 10, and 11. All right. After Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes and doubled his previous possessions. All his brothers, sisters, and former acquaintances came to him and dined with him in his house. They sympathized with him and comforted him concerning all the adversity the Lord had brought on him. Each one gave him a piece of silver and a gold earring. Lord, bless the hearing and the reading and the doing of his word. So back in those days, they didn't have coins and things like that, and gold was popular and it was easily heated and they could melt it down into statues and jewelry and all kinds of things. So that was popular. Silver was more precious metal back in then. It took a little bit more refining. But in this restoration process, the Lord did it, right? And uh, in all, it always boils back to obedience. You know, he prayed for his friend, and uh, the Lord restored his fortune and doubled his possessions. And all of his brothers and sisters who had abandoned him, you know, the, the fair weather friends, they ran out on him. They forsook him. And I look at this like, uh, I don't know, I tried to. Yeah, and then, you know, he obeyed, and, and he uh, look at uh, this. I think we, as believers in the time that we're living in, looking at this example of how Job uh, obeyed, and uh, he had went through his suffering and came back and was restored. We don't want to get it twisted that... Uh, just because you go through suffering and you do what God says that you're going to uh, reap all this returns and get everything back like Job had done. Right? We don't have to, don't get that messed up because uh, you don't always reap things. I mean, you don't always, you know, get all this stuff right here on earth. You know, we have heavenly promises in, in, in our obedience as well. But his family was brought back, and greater, the most important thing our book said about this whole thing was that Job had a greater understanding of God. And that was the real riches right there. A great all this that he went through was to, to show his faithfulness to put the devil in his place because you know it's like he kept accusing Job of like huh oh, you protecting yeah you keeping you don't let nothing happen to him but he gonna curse you you know if you take all this from him and God had faith in him just like uh, those who earlier Enoch, Abraham, they had faith in God, and they walked with God, and they kept God's commandment. And even some of the broken folks that did miserable things, they had a heart for God, like David, you know, a man after God's own heart, you know, and he knew him in spite of his talking about dysfunctional and being blessed. David was the ultimate, I think, of misfunction. And then we also see examples in our Bible, not only in Job, but we saw uh, the one who received this great inheritance, like King Solomon, wise man. We studied a lot of his stuff. All that, he had a great start, didn't he? No, that prayer that he did for the dedication of the temple, whew, made God fire up and smoke up the place and gave him more than he wanted. But, of course, all our good starts and everything. It's not that. you got to keep your eyes on the finish line, you know, and stay focused and don't build up those high places in our lives with our pious, with our uh, 
lust and what are our prize. But B, as this example here in uh, Job gave us, that we have to be uh, compassionate uh, friends, family members, and just strangers, and that we sh have these examples to show us how to do these things. And um, the question here is, how does what was restored to Job compared to what God will provide his redeemed people in heaven? I have a take on that, Joe. This is Ed Allen. Mm -hmm. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, get a little closer to the speaker or something. You were stronger earlier. All right, can you hear me now? <clears throat> yeah, we hear you. Okay. Uh, I have a take on that. Uh, uh, there's no comparison to what happened to Joe uh, and what what we will be redeemed to uh, it's when you're doing your Sunday school lesson your mind running in a lot of different directions and uh, my mind took me back to John 14 it's where Jesus said let not your heart be troubled believe it you believe in God believe also in me and uh, the third verse saying uh, It says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Uh, <clears throat> the redemption that Jesus had for us initially was redemption on the cross. Uh, this was redemption of the kingdom rules for us, which was our salvation, which is conditional. We have to do something, too. We have to accept him. However, John wrote uh, the book of John, and he also wrote the book of Revelation from uh, the Isle of Patmos, and I'm going to go over to Revelation and and uh, a quick connection on he said that he will come again and receive us to himself. If you look at Revelation 21, it connects uh, that going away and that coming again. In uh, 21, it tells you about the great wall that you will see. It says, and the city the new Jerusalem said that it had no need for a sun, neither the moon, and it had no need for light because the Lamb's face was light enough. This whole 21 tells us what we will be redeemed to. And that doesn't compare at all with anything on the face of this earth. When when we be with the Lamb, uh, that 21 tells us all that we will have. It says there will be no more crying. There will be no more pain. Can you imagine that? That's true redemption. Uh, this, this connection is through through John's vision that he had on uh, the the island of Patmos where he was banished to. But but there's no comparison. Uh, you can think of the brightest light that you can think of. Anything that happened or was received from Job's redemption would only be one tenth of a flicker of that bright light. 
This is true redemption when we wind up being with the Lamb. Okay, I would like to add a scripture to that, which would be 1 Corinthians 2 9, which says, But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. So we know that the restoration of believers, Job, we have in heaven, as they just read in these scriptures, a home provided eternally with the Father. And so through our hope, through our faith, through our obedience. It's as you we know that God is in control of everything. And he's sovereign and nothing happens outside of his will. Uh, Joe? Yes? Uh, you just mentioned uh, just a few minutes ago something about doing. About what? It's about doing. Mm-hmm. We have to do. Okay. In uh, 21 also, mm-hmm. it tells us who will not Unlock it. Uh, be redeemed. It says in uh, verse 8, it also says, but the fearful. It starts with the fearful, hmm. but the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the homemongers and the sorcerers and the idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. All right. Which is the second death. Those people will not be redeemed. It tells you everything here in 21 that you will witness. And this was a vision. It wasn't a dream. It was a vision by John. So it's a little bit different there. Okay. Thank you for that. That's what it's all about, making sure that we get the things. And a lot of times... We read earlier that in the first couple of verses, in Job's first question about who hides these things and counsel and conceals these things, and who also gives the wisdom to others to bring these things out, that we cannot be misguided, not misinformed, but to direct us into the right uh, attitude and direction and spiritual being that we can conform unto the image of his son that he provides for us. So that's all these things are in God's will. You know, he, a lot of times, he uses good, bad, whatever, to make sure that we get his point. And the whole book of Job is going through those things, sovereignty in all situations. So we're out of time. And uh, thank everyone for attending. Next week we're going to move into the book of Ecclesiastes, that's going to be in 1, 12 through 15 and 2, 18 through 28. And so 
as we apply the text for today's lesson on page 72 says believers can admit their dependence on God for all things. Believers can pray on behalf of others. What God has in store for his redeemed people will far outweigh any loss in this life. So this week we can intercede, we can pray for people. Put someone on your list to pray for. And if we have a chance to someone grieving or something, or or even in their glorious time, come along and let's be good counselors is what I'm trying to get to, comforters, and be good friends, not uh, and then a lot of times we have good intentions, but uh, they fall short. But we have to keep moving and following and reading and studying and growing. You know, it's never old. Us old dogs can still learn new tricks and uh, also learn new lessons. I shouldn't say tricks. Learn new lessons of God through his re- our reading and our studying. And so I know this is a challenge for those non-early birds to be up early in the morning like this, but uh, we have got through it with those faithful that attended. So let us have Brother Foresight close us out in prayer. All right. Our Father, we thank you now for Jesus. We thank you now for this time of Bible study. Be with us now now as we uh, go to our church for our first time being together. I pray that everything would be all right and be with the pastor, and he brings us our sermon for today. Now be with us and bless us, and we hope to see you all soon. And in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank Amen. you, Senior Member David, Amen. for your prayer and your reading today. Amen. You did a great job as usual. Amen. Amen. Thank all of you for your participation. And so I'm going to have to cut it brief because I'm on the road. Thank you, brother, Mr. Joe. Thank okay, you. until next time. Bye. Abiento. Right. Bye-bye. Can I have your phone? Peace. Bye-bye. Peace, health, and love. Can I have your phone? I'm leaving. Have a good